and welcome everyone. Let me just bring this up, get it into this mode. So what I wanted to talk about is just for 20, 25 minutes is some of the big trends and drivers that we see in fraud detection, particularly banking payments fraud detection. And I wanted to start with some good news and then we'll move on to some not so good news, but let's be positive, start with the good news. And this is from our most recent survey of CIOs. And the good news is that this is a top priority and hopefully it is for you as well. What this chart shows is that 63% of the CIOs that we asked see cyber and information security as the number one area where they'll be spending the largest amount of new or additional funding. So it won't go up by 63%, but 63% of CIOs said that this was their number one priority. The only surprise to me is that there's 1% who said that they are not increasing this by uh, and giving additional funding to it. I'd love to meet them. Um, that would be an interesting conversation. But the good news is, you know, this is attracting a lot of interest, a lot of money. You know, we see IT budgets increasing, but not always keeping up with inflation. Sometimes you have to cancel one project to fund another, but this is one that's at the top of the list. So it should be in a good place. So that's the good news. Not so good news is that this is a very fragmented area. So all those little yellow things popping up, at most banks, you may be an exception, these are usually separate systems. In many cases, they're even duplicated systems, and we'll see why they get duplicated in a minute. But people tend to buy these separate solutions. They've often usually been built as separate solutions. And over the years, we've acquired a lot of these different bits of IT real estate. And a bit like the picture behind it, you know, there's the confused looking polar bears and all this thing, which you'd expect to be a contiguous landmass, is breaking up into many little islands. A few of them do talk to each other, but many of them don't. And that's not good news. I mean, A, it's inefficient when we're spending a lot of money on a lot of systems that sometimes duplicate each other. And B, it's not so effective because they're not talking to each other. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're trying to achieve when we do get them to talk to each other in a minute. So that's the, the first part of this fragmented landscape. Um, let, let, let me just give you a little bit of light relief. You can see on the sort of top left there, that one of the yellow areas is behavioral biometrics. So we have all these separate systems for anti-money laundering, device ID, location intelligence, identity proofing. Behavioral biometrics is one of them. I was at an event recently um, where you could bring your partner. I brought my wife along and it was another transaction monitoring vendor whose name I won't mention. And you know, they'd invited their partners. One of them is you know, a specialist in behavioral biometrics. And he started to talk to me as the so-called expert. And then my, he was saying, you know, do you know what bio, behavioral biometrics is? And my wife leapt in at this point. Now, my wife is an artist nothing to do with IT, nothing to do with Gartner or fraud or banks or anything else. But she did know. She says, yes, I do know what this is. I was a little trepidatious. You know, what was she going to say at this point? But you know what? She had a fantastic point. Behavioral biometrics, you might think is a recent thing. It's all modern technology and all digital and mobile and everything. She pointed out that it goes back at least and it may go back decades or centuries even before this, that you can find this in 1958 in the book of Dr. No. So the first James Bond novel, and uh, there's a transmitter station in, in Jamaica and the baddies have shot the radio transmitters and London is all worried about this. They send out James Bond, but there's this explanation. You can see that, um, you know, if, the transmitter falls into the wrong hands, they will almost certainly know 
because even if they're torturing the operator and forcing them to send a message, all they have to do is slightly change the speed at which they hit the keys or the force with which they hit the keys or the rate at which they make mistakes. And that gives it away as clearly as if they had someone's fingerprint or whatever else identifies them uniquely. So, you know, a lot of this technology, this is the serious point, has been around for quite a long time. We still haven't quite joined it up. So um, assuming that, you know, people aren't being tortured these days, but maybe being impersonated, perhaps, why is it no better at banks these days? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, this is the other reason why. We had the fragmentation of the solutions. You can't find a single monolithic solution that does everything. Um, and it's the similar situation at banks. We have various different people in charge of different things. <laughs> Most of those things actually report to the chief information security officer, the CISO at the bank. So cybersecurity, things like account takeover, malware, um, <clears throat> uh, all those sort of things come under the CISO. The bit we're talking about today, the payments fraud detection, actually doesn't. That usually comes under either the head of cards, and it may be split between debit cards and credit cards and wire transfers, or it's the head of payments or the head of risk or the CIO, or perhaps all of those. And they're not necessarily talking to each other. This is where we get the duplication of solutions, which, as I pointed out, is, you know, A, very expensive. So banks are heavily siloed places. They're not very well connected in this area. Now, they're aware of this. I have uh, at least two conversations already this week with banks in the Middle East and in Turkey, where they were talking about exactly this situation. How can we do more? to consolidate and to uh, rationalize the systems that we have. So you may not be able to change a bank's organizational structure, but you can provide or influence the adoption of a more of a full stack of fraud solutions. Who are the vendors who have more of those things on the left? Either produced in-house or maybe they go through partners. Um, that's, so it, it doesn't, you know, they can be the single point of contact for this sort of thing. They can be the one stop shop for all the bank's needs. Um, that will enable more consolidation over time, more integration, and it enables you to join the dots. Now, this was a little bit I was hinting at a little bit earlier about well, you know, why was this, why does this matter? Okay, it's fragmented, it's duplicated, not terribly efficient. Why is it also ineffective? Well, here's why. You want to get that one-stop shop because you want to join the dots. Criminals get increasingly sophisticated at evading our checks and thresholds. So they fly just under the radar. They've figured out over time, well, what is the sort of amount that tends to trigger an alarm at the bank. So they keep it just under. If it's 10,000, they keep the transaction at 9,900. Doesn't trigger the alarm. If it's location, then they try to make sure that they faked a location either in the same city or the same region or the same country or anything. So they, if, if you're expected to be in Rome or Milan, it doesn't suddenly appear in Timbuktu. And they look at the device and they try and, you know, it, make it not so obvious that this is not the same device. So they're flying just under the radar on all those things. Individually, you wouldn't spot any of them. But collectively, if you could see that it nearly triggered three different alarms with one transaction, that should ring a bell. So this is why the enterprise-wide solution, the integrated or holistic solution, is so important. And, you know, we, it, it also means that we want to connect to different sources of data. So not just the transaction monitoring system down there, bottom left, but also perhaps the payment network, which might be an external source of data, maybe your core banking system, an internal source of data. So we want to try and get all of those things 
in the same picture as well. This is what it means when we talk about an holistic solution or an enterprise-wide solution. So we're bringing in data from all these places. I think another important trend in the market these days is where do you actually host all this? Now, traditionally, and if you look at legacy systems, most of them will still be on-premise, i.e. hosted by the bank at the bank in its data center. But increasingly, these things are moving to the cloud. Now, this isn't to pretend that the cloud doesn't have, have risks. People will want to look at latency, particularly in an era of real-time pay, payments. But we would argue, uh, and this is a quote, actually not from Gartner, this was from a conference I attended, the cloud has risks, but the biggest risk is not adopting the cloud. And, and for two particular reasons, one is compliance. Um, the fact is that banks are not terribly good, and I think this is understandable, at staying on the latest version of every piece of software under their roof. There's just too much. So they would be flooded every single day with you know, all kinds of patches and upgrades and so on. It's hard enough to keep my laptop up to date, never mind an entire bank up to date. So if you want to be on the latest version of the software for compliance, you stand a better chance if it's hosted in the cloud by the vendor. Doesn't guarantee compliance, there's no one who can do that, but at least you're on the latest version, it's more likely to have adopted the latest things. But also for, for performance, if you want to have access to the latest machine learning models, which they're recommending and suggesting, you want to be on the latest version. Now, you might not care if you've got a team of brilliant data scientists and you've constructed your own models and you don't need any help from anyone else. But if you're a smaller bank or a credit union, a, a, a Sparkassen, it might be that you don't have that army of data scientists and you do need help from the vendor to have the best performing uh, machine learning model. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but certainly the cloud has very significant advantages. I would argue they outweigh the disadvantages, and that's why you see the majority of new installations being hosted in the cloud. That's become much more acceptable, almost de rigueur. So what about machine learning? I said we'd talk a little bit more about this. And I think this is one of the places where we see the biggest changes and the fastest advances in this era. And it's one of the few areas where you can see real clear water between some of the vendors. So the way it's moving is from a process which was periodic and manual to one that's continuous and automatic. Now, why does that matter? Because banks tend to, when they, um, buy a new system, they will spend weeks or even months setting it up and tuning the data. And this is called a supervised machine learning model. They have tagged historical data, training it to be uh, super efficient so that it generates very few false positives and it finds lots of true positives. And on day one, that's generally what it does. It performs supremely well. Everyone's very happy slapping each other on the back. Over time, that performance deteriorates because the criminals are constantly changing the way they attack. They're changing the parameters, sometimes only tweaking them by a very small amount, but enough for it to look like something different. And your machine learning model is not tuned to pick all of those up. So over time, in six months time, the performance has really declined. And that's typically what people did. They waited six months. They then did a retraining it was heavily manual, labor intensive, and quite hard to deploy again. And you had to do this on the fly because now the system's live. So that was tricky. What we're moving to is continuous and automatic. We're not quite there. I would say that you could probably characterize it better as semi-automatic. So for instance, it is suggesting tweaks to existing business rules on a daily basis. This is what you should change, here's why, here's what it looks like, the new rule. Um, some of them are now moving towards suggesting entirely new rules, that's the next level up. So it's got a wizard and it suggests a new rule, do you like it or not, do you want to test it, then you can deploy it. And it's almost sort of plug and play. 
They're also providing champion challenger models for the machine learning. So over time, it'll come up with, here's an improvement, here's the model B. Do you want to test it against model A? We'll see which one performs better. So sometimes it's called A versus B testing, sometimes champion challenger. They have a sandbox. You can try these things out before you deploy. Some vendors, if they obtain permission from the banks, are able to pull the data from many banks. So you can see patterns of activity, suspicious activity, that would be hard to see in one bank, but across a group of banks is easier. They don't share that data with rival banks. That would breach confidentiality. But it means that sometimes the vendor has a better view of that criminal activity than any single bank can have. And then we've got the unsupervised model. Certain things, you know, like profiles of people, you can continuously update. This is uncontroversial. You know, you just need to check that it's happening efficiently and it pretty much, you know, can be done completely automatically. So I think this is the key change in machine learning. And this is one of the key trends in the whole area of fraud. The other one yeah, that sometimes sets them apart is, OK, once we've identified a transaction as suspicious, and we've probably had to put it on hold immediately because we're in an era of real-time payments, we don't have the luxury of an overnight batch where we've got a few hours to trap suspicious activities. We've had to put a hold on it. In the morning, in comes your fraud analyst, and they've got, here are your top 20 suspicious transactions. Please confirm, is this genuine or is this fake? Now, older systems did this entirely in a tabular interface, so it looks more like a spreadsheet. What we're moving to, one of the other trends we see, is more of a graphical interface, or at least it starts with a graphical interface. That's important when you're doing things like I was describing earlier with that triangulation between three different systems. You know, what's the patterns that have emerged in the last day or the last 24 hours? You know, which different systems is it triggering? Is it the biometrics or the AML or the device ID, the location intelligence? What is it that you know, we're seeing a pattern between? That's much easier to explain through a graphical interface. Then they often supply a hybrid. You want to be able to say, OK, I get the pattern. Now I need to delve down into some of the detail, exactly which rule was broken, which alarm was triggered, why, when, who, by, all that kind of detail. So that often is a, a means of switching from visual to tabular. And then another key capability, I think, you know, that sets some of the vendors apart from others is data ingestion. Now, nobody has an insufficient volume of data these days. We're all absolutely bombarded with data. So I think what really matters is first having the plumbing to be able to ingest that data quickly and easily. That's not so much of a problem. The problem is then doing the governance of that data. How do I actually make sense of it? So in the first place, we need links to some of the other vendors so we can import their data. Then we've got to separate the signal from the noise. We want to see the bits of data that actually matter rather than trawling through the entire mass and be able to act on that useful information. If we can get any prompts to say, this is what you should be looking at, and here's some suggestions about your next best action, this is what you should be doing about it, that is immensely helpful because that's helping your people to prioritize the most useful things and to be able to take the most effective actions. Talking about people, I think one of the things we don't see much of this yet, but there are you know, some beginnings of a trend towards some vendors being able to supply or at least link to a business process outsourcing or managed service. So who can really take this off your hands? Big banks, I don't think, will be so interested in this. They will have the fraud analysts. They will have the data scientists. But you know, you might want to be a small bank and you do need to supplement the team or you do need to outsource 
some of that. So more of a managed service. And somebody who can also take or insulate you from the complexity of managing an ecosystem of suppliers and innovators. Wouldn't it be great if you just had that single point of contact, someone who says, okay, I don't supply everything myself in-house, but I can manage it for you. I can be your gateway to all those resources. So if there's ever a problem, you come to me, I've got contacts with everyone else in the ecosystem. So I think this is an emerging trend at a very early stage in most cases. Talking of not being able to do it alone, uh, another thing we see is the emergence of some central utilities. Now, these are things, and they may be managed by a clearinghouse, by a payments network, by a central bank, by a regulator in financial services. They can't, it might be a consortium of banks. They can't really be done by any one bank. So if you want to do payee confirmation, for example, part of the authentication for payments, um, you would need some central utility to be able to do that. And similarly, we, you know, we see as an example last month from Australia, it's just uh, launched the next stage of a fraud reporting exchange. So when one bank spots a new kind of attack, it can share those examples. Everyone benefits because there's always a payer and a payee, and uh, it's not usually at the same bank. We can see that there's a lot of activity around cross-border payments, a notoriously tricky area with lots of middlemen and correspondent banks and so on. So we've got, uh, uh, it describes it here, and these you can follow these links, a prototype uh, based on the Eurozone's target instant, instant payment settlement system operated by the Bank of Italy on behalf uh, of the Euro system and overseen by the European Central Bank. So lots of people involved there. Uh, that's something that no bank could do alone. And finally, the one that's exercising a lot of um, nervous energy in North America, not in EMEA or APAC, is the launch of Fed now. So somewhat belatedly, perhaps, uh, the USA and Canada are finally uh, getting real-time payments, and there's a big new scheme, it launches in July, certainly for the USA. I think Canada might be a little bit later. Um, exciting on the one hand, and you know, a big boost. If you ever try to pay for things in the States, you'll know it's a long way behind uh, much of the rest of the world, but catching up quickly. Um, it does also create some worries, you know, um, you know, in terms of, you know, well, what does that mean? And, you know, one of the things we've just published at Gartner is this top technology payment trends report. And it looks at things like open payments and central bank digital currencies, both retail and wholesale and these cross-border payments and machine learning for enhancing fraud prevention in the little red circle there. So an area where real time has really increased the complexity in an exponential fashion. Um, which is, um, you know, one of the things uh, I always try and coach people, uh, the younger people in my team when they join Gartner about any kind of a report or any kind of a presentation, you have to create some kind of urgency. Real-time payments has really created that urgency. You have to explain to your audience, well, why should I care? You know, if, the, if I suddenly announce the moon is made of green cheese, very interesting, very controversial, does it really matter to me as a CIO? Probably not. So you've got to explain why they care about something, why they should believe you, what's the evidence for this, and then most importantly, what do I actually do about it? Once you've convinced me that this is urgent and it's real, what do I do next? Help me with it. Don't just you know shout, wolf, give me some positive action I can take. So I think the, uh, the urgency is that rise of money mule and authorized push payment types, which we will be talking about in a minute, because now that we're in an era of social media and digital communications, that leaves, unfortunately, a lot of our customers very vulnerable to these kinds of scams. Um, also, because people are getting scammed despite taking good precautions, um, we start to see the beginning of a trend, at least in the UK, and I suspect it will snowball to other countries, 
where the banks will have to reimburse the victims of automated push payments. It's not enough to say, well, you authorized this, you know, they, you know, they will now have to show that, uh, you know, the bank took every reasonable caution and if not reimburse the customer. And we, you know, we, we're starting to keep a database. I think we've got uh, over 500 examples now of AI use cases, a lot of them are about fraud and payments. You know, I've got examples like DBS in Singapore, improving their AML capability, Bank of New Zealand, trying to intercept fraud and activity before it even happens, before it actually becomes a payment. So looking at fraud patterns and trying to intercept them right at the beginning of that payment life cycle. So lots to think about, um, and I'll hand over now to Wido, who I think um, is going to go into a bit more detail about exactly the XTN capabilities here, and particularly things like Money Mule and APP. So um, I'll stop sharing, and over to you, please, um, Wido. Thank you very much, Pete. So give me a second, I will share my screen as well. First of all, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Guido Ronchetti, I'm the CTO of XTN. And as Pete was anticipating, I will go in deeper details uh, about uh, some of the strategies we can adopt uh, again, uh, authorized push payment fraud and money mill. And first of all, how XTN can, can help you uh, addressing those, those issues. But first of all, let me start by introducing some of the capabilities and the approach that XTN is adopting in the fraud space. And I think that really what what Peter has described as part of the, of the problem that we, we are all facing of solving that fragmentation of different solutions and different uh, vendors and roles inside the bank organization is one of the key points for the Axian vision about fraud prevention. So in this slide, you can see the three layers we focus on. And what we described as the, the cognitive security platform that is our main solution is really the holistic approach to fraud prevention. This is one of our key elements. And for us, this means looking at different layers, layers that are usually addressed by different vendors in a unique integrated solution. So if you think about this graph as an early tsunami warning system, if you wish, you have different levels that start from the end user, from the customer in the center, going to the service provider on the edge. And so the first layer is what we call the behavior in app protection layer. And this is really about looking at the behavioral uh, biometrics profile of the user together with some of the technological threats that affect mobile and web apps. The second layer is what we call the smart authentication. And in the second layer, we really focus on the identity of the user accessing. So strong customer authentication in the first place together with device fingerprinting and the behavioral profile again. And last but not least, uh, we correlate all those previous layers inside of our fraud protection uh, module, having together those in-app and authentication related layers together with the business content of the transaction, the transaction monitoring capabilities we have in place is really what we think gives you a complete tool and a very complete and multi-layer um, ability to uh, recognize and prevent frauds before happening. So moving ahead, let me show you uh, some of the use cases we usually uh, address. Of course, there are several more, those are the, the hot ones. Today, of course, we will focus on the ones we already introduced. So we will discuss the authorized push pain and fraud. And we will discuss our money mule hunting capabilities. As part of our money mule uh, hunting capabilities, we will also address the new account fraud topics being connected to the money mule. So before going in deeper details about how we address those use cases, let me just focus a bit on the type of data uh, that we, we collect. Uh, you can see some examples in this slide. Of course, one of the key data points we focus on are the biometrics data of the user. Uh, think about 
uh, moves, mouse activity, keystrokes, think about kinetic interaction with the mobile device. Those are some examples. Uh, of course, there are several more. more. So biometrics are data points that focus on the interaction, on the behavioral profile from a biometric perspective interacting with the app. The second type of uh, data points we focus on are contextual uh, data. Think about personal information that are available, uh, registry related information regarding the, the user. Think about account information, think about location intelligence, think about the device identity, so device fingerprinting, or technological elements related to the device, uh, jailbroken uh, rooted uh, devices, malware presence, and so on. So a second type of data points we collect and we focus on are contextual information. The third type I would mention are payment related data points. So of course the payee, the payer, uh, all the typical information that are part of the payment transaction, uh, the usual payment uh, schemas, uh, the usual payment patterns as well are part of what we, we collect. So what we do with those data points we focus on? Uh, we address two main pillars that are part of the analysis performed by the cognitive security platform. The first one is what we call the behavior analysis. And behavior analysis for us is focusing on how the user behave compare, comparing with the rest of the users that access that particular service. Behavior analysis is particularly useful when you are dealing with new users or users with little or no history, where you want to recognize unusual behavior uh, in the first place when they onboard, when they register uh, for the service. The second pillar is what we call the behavioral biometrics pillar. And this is really about building the behavioral profile of the user and comparing continuously the user activity in the service with that profile in order to recognize anomalies for that specific user. Is it unusual for a certain user? Uh, are we facing an account takeover or any kind of uh, uh, third party accessing with the credential of the user? Those are the kind of answer we answer with our behavioral biometrics capabilities. So let's now move on and go in deeper details about the authorized push payment front and monomium. In my presentation, I want to, to put together those two topics because I think those are two phases of the same fraudulent activity seen from two different angles. So the authorized push payment, of course, is where the fraud starts, while the money, money mule hunting scenario is where money goes starting from the victim and going to the, to the fraudster. So let's start with uh, the authorized push payment fraud. Of course, there are some risks that banks are facing and app fraud is really one of the more present types of, of frauds that are happening right now globally, I would say. And as all the, the different types of frauds, they present some a risk of financial loss in the first place. They are also very impacting from a reputational damage, damage standpoint. The perception of the victim of the lack of security in the service is something that is extremely damaging in that sense. And as Pete already uh, introduced, there are also some regulatory and legal consequences that relates to app fraud. Is one of the urgent topic that regulators are uh, addressing nowadays. So, there is a lot of initiatives happening, starting from the UK, but also in Europe, we are really discussing about those topics and, and, and how to address in a more structured way. And of course, there is an operational disruption as well in addressing those cases. Think about the contact center that have to deal with the victim. 
And then the second part of the equation is the money mule hunting. And now we are on a different side of the perspective. We are on the bank that received those money coming from the fraudulent activity and is actually a transit for the fraudster to reach the final destination. And again, in the money mule scenario, there is a high risk of operational cost. Managing money mules after the fact is extremely costly, is a manual operation. There is a reputational damage, again, is not something that the bank wants to be connected to money mill activity. And there are, of course, IML and legal liabilities uh, impacts as well that have to be considered. So let's now start from, up from the authorized push payment fraud and let's go in deeper details about how it works and which are uh, the, the features that XTN offers in that, that space. So let's very briefly describe how it works from a very high perspective. Of course, the first step is a fraudster that is calling the victim, someone that is using a certain banking service. The fraudster will gain the trust of the victim and tricks the victim into providing the information needed to log in to the banking portal and start uh, the, the, the fraudulent activity, the, insert the fraudulent transaction. They usually present themselves as some contact center from the bank or someone that is trustworthy, and they tend to guide the victim through the process, keeping the victim in the phone call. At a certain point, the fraudster will convince the victim to authorize the strong customer authentication flow required in order to sign the transaction, always remaining on the phone call. And at that point, the fraud is accomplished. So at that point, the victim has actually signed the fraudulent transaction. And this is where the app fraud scenario becomes tricky because we're not dealing with something that starts from the fraudster uh, without any interaction from the victim side. We are talking about a fraud that has been signed by the legitimate user. So this is really one of the growing threads that we see out there. Fraudster are employing tactics such as social engineering. They are relying on phone calls that appears to be from the banking contact center. And they are sometimes using malicious RAT uh, apps or remote control uh, publicly distributed apps as well, such as TeamViewer or AnyDesk. So in this scenario, XCN focus in, first of all, detecting any RAT malware present or any remote control app that is in place in the device. And on the other hand, we focus on the behavioral analysis of what happens inside the device. We focus on the behavioral biometrics and the interaction of the user with the app in order to spot, a, to spot the phone call during the, the activity of the user on one end, and also the anomalous interaction of the user that is not guiding uh, its own interaction through the app flow, but is guided by the fraudster. So it's a completely different way of dealing and interacting with the app. So having those elements together, we can really precisely recognize those type of, of uh, authorized push payment fraud as soon as the victim is signing the transaction. So as soon as the strong customer authentication uh, authorization uh, goes on. Let's now move to what happens next. So money is going out from the account of the victim and is moving to the fraudster account. And usually fraudsters tend to rely on money mule accounts in order to receive money coming from fraudulent activity. So let's just summarize which are the main phases that we will see in a second. Usually you will have someone, usually someone connected with the fraudster or the fraudster itself that is opening an account. So you will have the registration of a fake account or a synthetic account in order to have a working account to move money to. Then you will have incoming funds from 
fraudulent activity coming in in the, the mule account that the fraudster have opened. And third, you will have the cash out um, activity. So the fraudster will move all the money coming from the fraudulent activity out to a foreign country or to a crypto wallet, let's say. So let's see more in details how those different uh, phases uh, works and how we can detect those different behaviors. The first one is the fake account creation. So in during the, the account opening phase, so when the, the fake user is opening a new account, you will notice some behavior anomalies in the first place. There is a lack of confidence in, in writing personal information. The fraudster or the mule is not using its own information. So he, he will not have those muscular memory characteristic that usually goes with your personal information. The second aspect that we will focus on is the detection of copy and paste activity. Very often the mule will copy and paste someone else's information in order to onboard and opening a new, a new banking account. And the, the fraudster or the mule will also have an excessive savviness in interacting with the registration part process. Those profiles are opening several accounts each time. So they are used to go through the registration part process. It's not just opening one account as a regular user. It's about opening tens or hundreds of accounts. So they are extremely quick in moving through the process and they know the process very well. And this is another aspect we will focus on. And last but not least, they will reuse some of the personal information they are providing. So it's extremely annoying and time consuming to open a new phone number for each account or using multiple addresses if you expect to have something delivered to your address or opening new email accounts each time. So very frequently, uh, mules will reuse the same information. The second step we will focus on and we will detect is the incoming found detection. So those accounts are not regular banking accounts. Mules, mule accounts are accounts that are not used uh, regularly. They stay as, a, as a, a sleeping accounts for a long period of time. And then at a certain point, you will see multiple incoming transactions from different payers coming with a very uh, rapid uh, velocity. So those, those incoming transactions comes from the fraudulent activity. And we will focus on those incoming transactions, recognizing on one end the anomalous behavior of the account. So it's not something usual that you can uh, think will, will uh, is usually happening in regular accounts. On the other hand, we will check for watch lists in order to spot those, uh, those payers that have been blacklisted. And we will check for the rich genetic banks as well. So by looking at the velocity and the kind of behavior that we notice, the pattern that we notice regarding incoming funds, this is another very important feature we will focus on in order to recognize money mule accounts. The third step is about the cash out detection. So at the end of the, of the cycle regarding the money mule account, we will have those incoming transaction happening very quickly. And then we will have a unique transaction going to a foreign account or going to a crypto wallet. And this is another very important pattern regarding money mule. So a single transaction that will be in quick su succession with the incoming transaction where, that we saw in the previous slide. And again, we will recognize that anomalous behavior looking and relying on our behavior analysis features, we'll be able to look at the target bank as well. So crypto accounts or foreign uh, countries as one of the 
elements we will consider. And we will, of course, look at the usual behavior for that specific account. So having together those three elements gives really us a different approach regarding money mule detection. So on one end, we can prevent money mule when they onboard, when they register in the first place. But it's not always the case. Very often banks already have some mule inside their customer base that they have not detected in the first place. So the different approach regarding XTN, uh, cognitive security platform, is the fact that we are also able to eradicate existing money mules when they activate and they start receiving money and then moving money, uh, money outside uh, to the final uh, Froster account. Okay, so let's just uh, wrap up by reporting some of the, of the value that the XTN cognitive security can bring uh, to your business. Let's start with the authorized push payment fraud. Of course, uh, the, the goal is to avoid financial losses and to increase your customer base trust in your security uh, services. And of course, uh, ensure compliance as well. Uh, with the platform, uh, we have a very high detection rate of those kinds of frauds. So we are talking about more than 99% of detection rate with an accuracy uh, rate higher than the 95%. So it's a very clear indicator of authorized push payment behavior in the transactional flow. Same thing regarding money mule. So we are talking about more than 95% of money mule detection and an accuracy that is higher than the 85%. And again, in the money mule uh, perimeter, we will avoid extra operational costs and increase trust while providing IML uh, regulatory compliance as well. Of course, another important point regarding MoneyMule is the fact that we will prevent the registration of fake accounts. And this will, of course, safe safeguard uh, your customer growth and your investment in uh, customer new customer adoption. So thank you for listening. And uh, I, I will stop here. So I will let Lucia uh, report some of the questions. Yes, sure. Uh, we have just a minute left. Um, some questions have already arrived. I will start uh, with those. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can continue submitting if you want. Um, I start with Pete. The question is, how will orchestration as a feature play a role in combating banking fraud processes? Great. Thank you, Maria. Um, so orchestration is going to be super important. Um, in my bid, I was talking about connecting the dots, trying to reduce that fragmentation and how that makes the whole business of fraud detection more efficient, more effective, more accurate. And, and you saw that in Weedo's presentation just now about APP and Money Mule, the rates of detection and the prevention of loss. So it's certainly important. Um, I would say orchestration works very well in those models where you need a hub and a spoke. If you think about orchestration, the idea is that somebody at the center is acting as the conductor and everyone else is in a slightly lesser role and you tell them when to come in and play their part. Sometimes you need a more fluid network without depending on somebody at the center so that other parties can react with each other, interact with each other. So I think choreography, works better there more like a dance where you know nobody says exactly what you have to do but there are certain rules when you're doing a waltz you know how you negotiate getting to the corner and not bumping into other people so what you need is a set of protocols and rules and that enables you to interact in a much more fluid way and without waiting for that 
central coordination. So I think it's a you know a case of horses for courses. Sometimes orchestration is the ideal model. Sometimes it's choreography, but always it's about connecting those dots. Okay, perfect. I'll uh, there is another question linked to this topic for we. Um, and it's saying regarding the topic of orchestration, what do you have available and how do you suggest customers utilize it? Yes, thank you. So um, regarding orchestration, the platform is designed to be uh, orchestrating the interaction with the different sources of data that are part of the evaluation flow. So we have several different hooks that are part of the of the platform's workflow that let you ingest data from the outside before the evaluation and then trigger external services or external solutions after the evaluation. So it's really designed in order to interact both with the um, data sources that are needed for the risk evaluation, for the um, transactional evaluation, and then to interact with those services that are part of the, uh, the, the, the fraud um, management process. Think about step up authentication, think about reporting to a CRM or a CM uh, after uh, the, the, the risk evaluation. Think about notifying emails to the right stakeholders. So it's really designed to be part of a wider process that is the, the process, the fraud process inside the bank organization. Great. I have another question for you, Guido. Um, what have you done in terms of enriching analysis through external information? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a very good good question. I think it it re it, it related to what it was was saying at the beginning of the presentation as well. Uh, so, part of of what the platform is able to do is to federate information coming from the outside. So think about uh, IOCs, so indicators of compromissions, or IOFs, uh, indicators of frauds, that comes from the different uh, uh, groups, uh, banking groups or uh, state level groups that share intelligence information that are useful for fraud prevention. The platform can be part of those uh, federation, of those uh, sharings. And this is the first aspect that we focus on. A second uh, feature that we have in place in order to share information and gives our clients advantages, a time advantage regarding what our clients see in their, in their own environments is what we call the XTM sharing uh, capabilities. So our clients can share information in, in anonymous form and of course, with all the, the different uh, mechanisms needed to protect the, the end users' privacy. And they sh can share those information, those indicators of growth in order to have in real time uh, data points that can be helpful to prevent similar fraudulent patterns that happens in their own environment. So we are going in the direction of having those different integration points as the 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 base of all our data sharing and all our real-time um, indicator of fraud sharing capabilities. 